Welcome to the Honor It All podcast. I'm Honor Garrett, your host, and we're here to honor all that is good in the world. Each podcast, I interview top professionals around the globe who are making a difference, impacting lives, and creating positive change. Today, we have Dr. Haley Nelson, a PhD in psychological and brain sciences from the John Hopkins University and is a tenured professor of psychology at a college in the Philadelphia area. Combining her knowledge of the human mind and brain health with her passion for education, teaching, and mentoring, she started Be Well with Dr. Haley, where she is passionate about making neuroscience approachable for everyone. What I think makes Dr. Haley so engaging is her tremendous knowledge of brain science and her gift in making it simple enough so we, I mean, I can understand it. I'm so honored to have you here with me today. Dr. Haley is part of the Honor It All podcast. Welcome. How are you? I'm doing great, Honor. Thank you so much for having me. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's so funny. So we're both in Pennsylvania and we met on Clubhouse. And what I think is so interesting about that is we meet people from all over the world. (laughs) And yet I can meet somebody in my backyard, basically, and I would have never met you what, if it wasn't for Clubhouse. So I'm, I'm so thankful for that. And we met in a mental wellness um, marathon room. So, yeah. Um, and what's actually pretty ironic about that, the host of that is Mark Hayford. And he and I literally live in the same town, like same zip code, but I've never met face to face either. So we've met, you know, he, when we met once, he didn't know who I was. I didn't really know who he was. So we have crossed paths before, but now we're buddy, buddy, and we're texting each other all the time. And we literally are around the corner from each other. So it was so ironic that the three of us all living so close to each other met on clubhouse with people all over the country, all over the world. And here we are, the three of us that we could just go grab some coffee if we wanted to. (laughs) Well, and that's what's so exciting because we will. And now that the pandemic we think is kind of done its course we're hoping keeping our fingers crossed yeah that we'll be able to get to see you in person but this is the next best thing to have you here on the podcast so um i want our listeners to know and learn a little bit about you so could you give me a little bit of your background did you always want to be a doctor have you always been fascinated with brain health (sighs) loaded question who am i right um well first and foremost i'm a mom i have two very active young boys. They are currently seven and four. Um, So I have my hands full with them. And then I am, um, you know, a professor as well, starting out. So I grew up in a house up in Ithaca, New York. So my dad was a college professor as well. And I just loved the lifestyle that he was able to create for our family. Summers off, nice winter breaks. You know, if he wanted to make extra money, he could pick up extra courses. We were always traveling and just being together as a family unit. My mom was also in the school system. So just having that family unit together was always so important to me. So I knew that I wanted to um, somehow be involved in education. Um, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. When I was in high school, I was really passionate about performing arts. I was actually really loving musical theater. I was a tap dancer. I still am a tap dancer. Um, don't ask me because we're on Zoom and you don't want to see what's going on below, <laughs> below the belt. I may or may not have pants on. No, I do have pants <laughs> Oh, that's the beauty of all this. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but so it was one of those things when I graduated high school, I had to decide, do I want to pursue performing arts and study theater and music, musical theater, or do I want to do something that I'm also really good at, which is science? Like I'm one of those people that people hated that wouldn't really have to study very hard <laughs> and just got science and math. Like it just came very easily for me. And I recognize that, right? Um, and so I decided to put my eggs in the science basket because I thought that that was a more straightforward and secure career path for me. 18 years old. I mean, why was I even thinking about like, oh, what's most 18 year olds are just doing what their heart desires. But I was like, really, I need, I don't know, I call it my anxiety, whatever. I was really focused on that. And so I went in as biology pre-med major and I quickly realized that the biology courses that I was taking were all about photosynthesis and, you know, earth science, which 
is very important, right? I loved learning about it. However, it didn't get me out of bed in the morning. It didn't get me to wake up and go to those 8 a.m. lectures, right? And then for an elective, I took introductory psychology and I was like, oh my God, my mind literally was just blown. I couldn't wait to go. I was talking to my professors. I became a teaching assistant as an undergrad. I just loved everything about psychology because it was really understanding and integrating human behavior and thoughts and why we do what we do. And I came at it from a more biological perspective because I did have that strong hard science background to be able to say, okay, yes, we can talk about theories and, and things like that, but now let's actually test it in the lab and do more of an experimental psychology approach. So I just loved that I found a field that I could really mix and blend those two passions. And so I quickly switched to a psychology major, um, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do with that. I thought I wanted to go into clinical psychology and be a counselor. Until um, I, so after graduating college, um, a couple girlfriends were just like, hey, what do you, what do you want to do? I had no plan for my future, what I wanted to do. And they were moving to DC to just waitress and party. And I said, sure, I'll go move to DC. So I moved to DC with no plan. And I met some people, I was working at a bar, I was waitressing at a bar. And I met some um, researchers at the National Institutes of Health while I was down there. And we just started chatting and they said, you should apply for a research fellowship position. And I got it. And because I was really passionate about clinical psych, I thought, and I very quickly realized, so I did do uh, two years of research at the National Institutes of Health. And um, I didn't want to work with a clinical population. I didn't, that just wasn't, um, I, it was, you know, somebody canceled an appointment. My whole day was messed up. My whole schedule was messed up. So I realized that I wanted to, be able to do more things with the brain and understand more physically, like what's going on at a cellular level. And you can't do that with humans, right? I can't say, hey, honor, get pregnant, give me your child. And I'm going to put all these different hormones and then I'm going to take their brain out and cut it up and see what's actually going on. I mean, completely yeah, unethical. <laughs> <laughs> that but with animals, you can do that ethically. And so um, that's when I started really getting into the neuroscience aspect of motivated behaviors and that's what my PhD is in from Johns Hopkins. And then, um, you know, being able to now take that and as a professor, be able to teach and inspire other young, curious minds about it. And um, I, I absolutely love what I do. I, I mean, I love just even as a health life and mindset coach that I'm now just helping people navigate their journey is just obviously always been of interest to me. But I'm so happy that like the mental health um, discussion has become, has finally come to the forefront. And it's really a lot about understanding the brain and why we have these behaviors. And, you know, I feel like so for so many years, people never mentioned mental health because mental health meant mental illness. Mm -hmm. but that's not true. Mental health is just like physical health. You can either have bad health or good health. You can either have good mental health or bad mental health. And it's a discussion we need to have. Um, and so obviously you understanding the brain so well, that just trans transitioned, I guess, into doing and really helping people. Often. Yeah. So it was always something that I was interested in for my own self-discovery. So obviously, I mean, to get your PhD in brain sciences, you have to be interested in it because otherwise that's, that's a pretty hard, uh, you know, degree to get if you're just doing it just to get the degree. Like you, only certain types of people have to be motivated and driven for that very specific. And my topic, which is probably for a whole nother podcast, but it was on male sexual behavior. I was looking at vertebrate evolution and different dopamine receptor subtypes. It was so, so, so specific, right? So I was an expert in this very minute field of science, right? And I realized that People, they want to understand the brain, but they don't necessarily need to know all those nitty gritty details. But if I understand the nitty gritty details and then I can translate that and communicate it to an average learner, then everybody can be for the better, right? So that's when I, and I've honed my skills with that. So I've, I was a faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania, which is Ivy League, right? And now I'm at a community college and 
it was a big transition for me to be teaching different levels like that. So, but right now in my community college, I have students who could be at Ivy League, right? They're just saving money and <laughs> going to a community college for the first two years instead of, you know, spending all that money. But then I have other students in the class that I don't know how they graduated high school, right? The reading level is, is, is bad. And then I have 65 year olds who just wanna take some extra classes and learn something new. And I have really overachieving high schoolers who are 16 years old and just wanna get a couple extra college credits before they start their college career, all in the same classroom. Wow. So the converse, and I have single mothers who are working full-time and in school full-time. And then I have working professionals who are just trying to get some continuing education. And the conversations and the discussions that I have in there has really helped me hone my skills on being able to take this really hard scientific facts and data and be able to make it approachable to literally everyone for whatever their needs are. And then guide people on their own journey of inquisition. Like, what are you curious about? What do you wanna know more about? So I always offer that to my students. Instead of just saying, here's a paper you have to write, here's a topic. I let them pick their topic that interests them. So if they have a grandmother who's suffering from Alzheimer's disease and they wanna find a more holistic way to be able to mitigate some of the effects, Mm -hmm. They can go look up the effects of cinnamon, for example, on mental health and mental acuity. Or if I have other people who are taking um, Zoloft and they want to understand how SSRIs work and how it might be different for adolescent brain versus an adult brain, they can, whatever it is that motivates them and, and instills this curiosity, I run with it and I just help mentor them and guide them on that journey to how to find the information, how to make sure it's credible sources, and then how to communicate it in a scientific way, but that also the average person can understand. Well, that, that is so impactful because really, as long as people are interested in learning, because I think that's what keeps us alive and motivated and inspired and growing. And just to actually have an environment where you're teaching so many people at different age groups. I think that would be so fun because my, like my kids, they absolutely, we're a close family. We all get along. They love their mom and dad, but they love their grandparents too. And it's so fun to see all these different generations get together and you really have a better understanding. What about you as a mom and doing the studies that you've done? Do you feel like it's prepared you or you understand better when your child acts a certain way? <laughs> yeah. Hindsight's 2020 20, though, right? I'm still a mom. I'm still a real person. And when my kid's having that tantrum in Target, <laughs> how do I respond then versus when I get home and after taking a deep breath and I'm no longer in that red zone. And then I can cognitively think about, okay, did I behave correctly? What should I have done differently? How can I communicate this differently? So I am a real person, right? But I do know scientifically what I'm supposed to do and what works best for most children, not all children, um, and what works best in our household. I mean, every child is different. Every parent-child relationship is different. Um, and I think it's really important to just be able to sit, step back and think about that, what kind of a parent you are and how you were raised as well. So my husband is a little older than me. Um, I mean, I'm not, he's not like in a walker or anything like that. We're still young. You wouldn't know he's older than me. Um, but he was the youngest of his family. And so his parents are significantly older than my parents. So they were from a different generation. And the way that he was raised was definitely more conservative compared to me who grew up in Ithaca, New York, which is like hippie central, very liberal, open-minded, open to exploration and figuring out who you are yeah. versus, you know, what he experienced as a child. And then, so now as parents, we have to find that happy balance and that happy medium. And it's been challenging, but I think we've, we've figured it out. I think we have some pretty cool kids, um, which, you know, but to get back to your point, knowing my studies. So the fact that I studied male sexual behavior and I have two young boys, I cannot wait until I get to tell them the birds and the bees. And I am so excited. I'm just waiting for them to ask and I am ready to go. I am like, yes, I'm going to have like infographics and 
<laughs> but I mean, I try to instill this curiosity, but also keep it real and scientific. So obviously I don't want them, I want them to be empowered with knowledge instead of just hearing stuff from their friends or from YouTube or whatever it is that they're watching. I want them to actually know what's true, but then also still be curious about it so that they can figure out what makes sense for them and, you know, be able to ask and feel comfortable asking questions. That's ideally what I want, but you, I mean, I'm sure it's easier said than done as they get older. I'm sure when your kids were starting to get older and you're watching them, it's gotta be hard. Cause you know, you think, you know, better, right. You have a more functional prefrontal cortex. You can make these decisions and you're watching these teenagers make quote unquote dumb choices, but do you just let them figure it out on their own? Do you, does mama bear come out and protect them? I have no idea what I'm going to be like when they start doing that. Well, it's such an interesting topic and that, that could be, we could talk about that all day because I'm <laughs> four grown children and my youngest is 19 and the other three are out of college. Uh, 21, 24, 26. And we were pretty strict. Uh, and we have great kids. They didn't rebel. They were very much rule followers, but there's a fine line where I go sometimes, did I prevent them or make them scared of taking risk? Mm. I want my children to take a chance and have faith and do some things that that, um, that I think the great people do, you have to have that boldness and, and not be afraid and not have any fear. So, you know, as a parent, I'm like, I've got great kids, but sometimes I wonder, did I instill some fear in them by not intentionally? We all are doing the best that we can, right? Oh, I know. And there's no right or wrong way either. You know, it's just, as long as you're not neglecting your child or hurting them in any way, you know, there's no right or wrong way. There's your way and you make the best of it. I mean, we're all going to, all of our kids are going to be in psychotherapy at some point in their life. And it's probably our fault <laughs> at some point. Right. And that's okay. Getting back to your point about mental wellness, we should be all, I, I always tell my students because as a college student, they get free <laughs> psychotherapy at the, the counseling center. And I'm like, I wish I was a student so I could get free psychotherapy. I mean, who doesn't want that to really sit and think about what they're doing and how their life is and where they want to go and, and all of these wonderful services that colleges provide for their students and people, they just still have the stigma about, well, if I go talk to somebody, then that means I'm sick, that there's something wrong with me. And so I always try to normalize it and say, I go talk to somebody right. and here I like, you look at me thinking I have all my S-H-I-T together, right? I have my kids here, so I can't say it out loud, but you know, just, but I really don't, nobody does. We're all in recovery from something. We're all working, we're all work in progress and it's okay to talk about it and it's okay to ask for help. And we're all impressed and our subconscious has been impressed from when we were, you know, what, seven years old. So sometimes we're making decisions as an adult based on these subconscious thoughts that we actually molded and, and set in place from the mind of a seven-year-old. Right. And so that's when, that is why this work is so powerful to go in and talk to somebody and really get to know who you are and why you believe what you believe and then question it. Like you said, use it, be curious because just because we think something does not make it true. Right. And so that was a big thing for me. Like, oh, you think if you just think it, then it must be true. And we tell ourselves lies all day long. <laughs> so um, especially that critter brain or the monkey mind that we have. So what do you think is the biggest factor in people's mental health? Like what, um, what do you think influences it the most? Or is it just different for everyone? It is different for everyone because some people have biological underpinnings, right? That they're born with a certain genetics and they have a low amount of serotonin receptors or lower amount of dopamine receptors or too high of dopamine, receptors, whatever it is, right? So there's definitely that physiological component. Um, but for the average person, I believe that we're all on a spectrum, right? And that everything that happens to us, whether it's the sun shining or the sounds that are coming in or the smells from the aromatherapy behind me or everything that comes into our senses or our own internal thoughts as well 
they pass through a psychological filter. And it's up to us. We can't control how much sunlight is being emitted from the sun, right? But we can control our actions and our behavior. So if it's too much, we go inside, we get in the shade, we put sunscreen on, right? right. So just like that, just like how we're going to interact with that external influence, we do have that control over how we're going to react and respond and feel about other people in our life, other situations in our life, our own internal thoughts as well. So, but it, it doesn't come naturally. It does go through this psychological filter, but we can train it to, instead of looking at a stressful situation as a threat, we can train ourselves to look at it as a challenge. And a lot of it has to do with work that you do, right? Mindset and how we're processing and just changing our vernacular, changing the words that we use to describe the situations that we're in. So instead of saying, oh, I have to go to work today, why don't you say, I get to go to work today? I have a job. I should be grateful. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Right. And then if it gets to the point where you just truly aren't happy about your work, then sit and talk to somebody to figure out what is going to make you happy so that when you get out of bed, you actually truly believe I get to go do this. What is it that's going to instill this curiosity and this growth mindset and make you happy? Um, you know, and so a lot of it, I think, is that psychological filter. And that is something that if we don't currently have control over it, it's something that we can learn and grow. And as a neuroscientist, right? So when you're talking how you mentioned, you know, your subconscious and unconscious brain and things that you learned as a seven-year-old and experience and how that's influencing your behavior as an adult, as a neuroscientist, I'm just thinking about how plastic our brain is that we have neuroplasticity, that we can create these new synapses and connections. And as we create these habits, the stronger those connections become, then those become habitual. And those become our go-to automatic responses instead of what was primed through early childhood. And we can see that. I mean, we can test it in a lab with animals. We can test it with humans. We, can, we know that we're capable of doing it from a cellular level. So I think that when people think and come at mental health from the fact that it is a science, at least this is my impression, right? That if people know that there is actually hard data backing up psychotherapy and backing up mindfulness and backing up the importance of exercise and fueling our bodies with healthy foods that are full of nutrients and things like that, there's actual scientific data to support how that changes the way that you think and therefore how you act and then how other people interact with you. I think people are more open to the idea of talking to somebody and understanding that it's not just this frou-frou stuff of, yeah, I can share my feeling that does, it's not gonna do anything. No, it actually is. It's creating new connections and changing the way that you think about things just by going through the motions. Just like if you wanna become a bodybuilder, you don't just all of a sudden start lifting 500 pound weights. I don't even know how much that is. I'm not a bodybuilder. Um, you start small. If you're like me, you're gonna start with five, 10 pound weights and just do you know like these things, bicep curls. I'm not gonna get up there and be an Olympic athlete right away. You have to practice, you have to work on it and you hone that skill and then eventually you are able to do those things. But people, I think they want a quick fix. They say, I want to feel better now. Yeah. But you don't say that going to the gym, I want to run a marathon now. Sure, you want to, but you have to put in the work. And it's the same with mental health. Absolutely. And the good news is we can change our brain. We can change. We, we actually, if we take responsibility of our life, and our actions, we really have the capability, like you said, what you focus on grows, what fires together, wires together. It's a matter of, like you said, just going to the gym. If I want to add five pounds of muscle, it's not going to happen overnight. No. You're going to have to go a few times a week, you know, learn different, um, you know, learn different exercises, be consistent. And that's what I think people want to just go meditate and go, well, it didn't work. Or they want, you know, want to do some mindful practices or some breathing like, okay, I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm still tired. I'm still anxious. Well, you have to give it time and 
we also have to get in the right frame of mind. So, right. And so mindfulness and meditation can help put you in that state of mind. So that does work, you know, especially for different conditions and things, but you know, the hard, really hard work of really questioning and interpreting your thoughts and your actions that, you know, through cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, that's, that's hard work. It's not for everyone. Not everybody is able to get to that point right away from day one. Right. And so, you know, you have just like any other muscle in your body, even though the brain isn't a muscle, but it's a good analogy. You have to practice and you have to work and you have to be in that right frame of mind. And so sometimes breathing can get you there and meditating can get you there. Journaling can get you there so that you then can do the, the hard work too. And it's small, simple steps. Um, a lot of people say they lack confidence and somebody said a quote a few months ago that I heard, and it, it really resonated with me. They said, confidence comes from keeping the promises you make to yourself. Mm. So when you keep breaking your own, Oh, I'm going to eat healthy today. And then you don't, then you don't trust yourself mm -hmm. because you keep failing. So but if you can just put out small, simple things that you know you can do, you, you gain a little more trust, you gain a little more confidence in yourself. And you're like, okay, I can do this. So I would just tell everybody, give yourself some grace, start going in the right direction and um, it, it can make a difference. And as a health coach, I really believe food plays a huge part. Food is medicine or it's point mm -hmm. basically. Um, you probably know more about that than I do of how it can actually affect your brain yeah. and, and the serotonin and all the, all the hormones and things that it produces. I love talking to people about it too. So it's actually, it's funny. Well, it's not funny. It's ironic that, you know, so I, I have my degree in neuroscience, you know, psychological brain sciences from Johns Hopkins, very prestigious institution, very prestigious degree. I get that. However, I didn't really put two and two together about the importance of gut health and how that can influence your brain health and mind health until I went through it myself. And it was through my own personal health journey that I said, whoa, I was just trying to lose weight. Why am I sleeping better? Why am I feeling better? Right. And really understanding the gut microbiome, which I know is such a huge topic now, but people have been studying it for a very long time. It's just now all of a sudden people are listening, I think. Mm -hmm. And our second brain, our enteric neuro nervous system and how the foods that we eat, I always knew the precursors to serotonin, you need, you know, L-tryptophan and things like that, which is an amino acid you get from different proteins and things like that. But I never really put two and two together that, okay, yes, I can eat the turkey that has tryptophan, but if I don't have the proper microbiome and the proper balance of good and bad bacteria to be able to process it and digest it and absorb it, then that's influencing my serotonin production, which is going to influence my mood. And it's going to influence my motivation. It's going to influence my sleep and wake patterns and my awareness and focus. It's going to influence all that. So I actually, I work with people individually, as well as in groups, helping them identify foods that they can eliminate as well as foods and supplements and things like that, that can help fuel them and be able to identify. Cause for me, I discovered that gluten, I'm sensitive to it. I haven't been diagnosed with celiac disease. I never, I just don't eat it. So I can't really get tested for it anymore. <laughs> But it's one of those things that I discovered by cutting that out, I had more mental focus, my skin cleared, I had more energy. And so, but I discovered that through, it was a process to get there. So I like helping people discover what it is for them. Maybe it's dairy, maybe it's soy, maybe it's processed sugars. I mean, everybody should cut out processed sugars, <laughs> but you know, some people more than others, right? And figuring out what that is to help fuel your mind and your body so that you can thrive. And then what I can offer is the scientific explanation for why that is and talk about inflammation, how just overall body inflammation can inhibit the production of serotonin. And this is just an example. It can inhibit so many other things, but how just having, you know, some inflammation in your body that increase in the liver enzymes and things like that can actually inhibit and alter your mood and the stability and the health of your brain. So taking care of your body include, or taking care of your mind includes taking care of your body. 
And that can be through exercise, through meditation, through eating right, through drinking more water. That's a huge one. Drink water. Everybody, you should be drinking water right now. As you're listening to me, take a break, take a deep breath, go grab some water. I got some right here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're 60 to 70% water. And I think um, what our brain is, what, 85% water? It's I don't like- know the actual percent, a lot, right? And we have a lot of fat in our brain too. And when I see people doing these low fat diets, I'm like, and low sugar, we need glucose and we need fat in our brain and we need salts. And when people do some of these uh, diets that are long lasting, every, a, a good detox, I, I'll do a good detox every once in a while for like a week, but I'm not going to do it long lasting. I get scared when I see people doing some of these things. And I just want to make sure that their physicians are aware of it, that there is a, a certified and qualified practitioner who's monitoring to make sure that it's ideal for them and their unique situation. Cause we do need a proper balance of macronutrients and micronutrients. You know, all of this so well, and I know that you do excellent work coaching people on their overall health. So I'm, I'm speaking to the pri- choir right now, but <laughs> what's so beautiful is that now, uh, science and it just physical health and nutrition and Eastern medicine and all the things are, and even spirituality, they're all coming together. And we're finally seeing that it's all connected. It, it's well, not, it, it absolutely thing. is, but I still feel that people, a lot of practitioners are very set in their ways and aren't interested in hearing somebody else's perspective. So there's a lot of Western medicine people. And I was one of them. If you had tried to have this conversation with me 10 years ago, I would have said, honor, no, you're not my people. <laughs> right. <laughs> But it was through, and call it mother's intuition or whatever it was, is when I became a mother, things started happening to me that I just couldn't explain. And then, so I started questioning my own spirituality and and the universe and different terms that other practitioners can explain through Eastern medicine and different holistic practices that necessarily weren't exactly the same as what Western medicine, which is what I was trained in, Mm -hmm. right? And so- I love to be able to communicate and talk to people from a different perspective so I can continue to learn and grow so that I can continue to help more people because what works for one person, we're not, and none of us can fit into a cookie cutter. And so maybe going to get acupuncture and taking an antidepressant works for somebody, maybe doing a completely holistic or just changing and just eating clean works for somebody else. We can't just fit in these bubbles. We have to be able to communicate and figure out Eastern, Western, other holistic, the universe, spirituality, going on retreats to a a Buddhist monk. I don't know, right? Whatever's going to help you is what's going to work. Now, I, as a scientist, I love to see the data, but I do understand that some things just can't be explained through science. Exactly. And but even so, some of those things, because of your thoughts, it actually, I think now can be proved through science or now they can measure frequencies and things like that. Because, you know, I'm one of those people, I'll tell you, just stay curious, stay curious, because I'm the one that will be journaling and reading scripture in the Bible. But I also am trying to align my chakras and strengthen my the energy in my body. And people are like, what? You can't do both of those. I'm like, I absolutely can. (laughs) I get that all the time because I am a spiritual, I was raised Christian and I still have, I still go to church. I raise my children in the church. It's something that's very important for us. If more practitioners on both sides, right, are open to interpretation and understanding chakras and understand, you know, from a Western medicine trained people understanding chakras, but then also Eastern trained physicians and practitioners understanding the science behind it. And how a lot of times we're talking about the same thing. We just use different terms. Absolutely. It's yeah. just, a, it's just like learning a different language, right? And, and that's all it is. We're yeah. talking about the same thing. And some things actually can be, we can put people in an fMRI scanner and actually measure the oxygenated blood going to different parts of the brain, which really just means more activity in different parts of the brain. And we can see what happens when somebody is tripping on LSD and see what's going on in their brain. And also when somebody's, you know, doing a simple math problem and we can see what brain areas are activated 
when they're doing these different behaviors. And so science, as, as technology advances, we're able to ask different questions to be able to understand more physiologically what's going on. And it's almost always supporting some of these philosophies that have been in practice for thousands and thousands of years. But now we actually do have some evidence to back it up. Now, I think that's, to me, that's so exciting because um, I, I'm one of those people that I can see both sides. And, and so for those people who don't, I, I want them to be open and curious. But I know that there are people in the audience right now listening that are struggling right now in their life. You know, we, we've been talking a lot about mental um, health, whether it's because of cir circumstances, you know, or their health or whatever it might be. Do you have any advice or encouragement that you would give somebody out there that might be listening right now? Absolutely. So first, just know you're not alone. As I mentioned, I believe that it's a spectrum and we're all struggling in some way, shape or form. Don't compare yourself to others because what you see on the outside might not be what's actually true for them on the inside. And don't be afraid to ask for help. There are people out there, find your people that will listen, right? We have two ears and one mouth for a reason. And if you're surrounding yourself with people who talk, 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 and don't listen, those might not be the people you want to turn to when you need somebody to support you and to listen. And so find those people. Now you can pay for it, right? You can go to a coach, you can go to a, a psychotherapist, you can go to your physician and whether your insurance is paying for it or you're paying out of pocket, but you can also reach out to a, a pastor. You can reach out to your neighbor, ask a friend to go for a walk and just talk and get outside and move your body and talk to nature, talk to yourself, right? Ask God for help, ask whatever it is, but just be willing and open to asking for help. And I think in today's society, we struggle with that. I struggled with it this past year, right? I was trying to be super mom. I thought I could handle it all. I was working full-time from home. I had a first grader who was learning how to Zoom and learning how to read and tie his shoes all at the same time. And then I had a preschooler and here I am at home trying to do it all. I'm trying to teach my college students and a, he turned four this past year, a three-year-old, right? Potty train and doing it all at once. And I, I was going to lose it, right? And happens to the best of us. And I asked for help. And that was the best thing I could do. I, I released things that I knew I couldn't control. I let other people take over certain things that as a perfectionist and type A personality, I'm like, it's okay if the peanut butter isn't spread perfectly on the bread, right? <laughs> they're still going to get fed and they're still going to get washed. And it's, you know, everything will be okay. I had to release some of that so that I could thrive, so that more wonderful things could come into my life by releasing some of those things. So long story short, I know too late, <laughs> but if people are struggling, just know you're not alone. We're all there and there are people out there who will support you. So just don't be afraid to ask. Absolutely. And if people offer, don't try to be the mortar and say, no, I don't, I don't need help. I don't need help. If people are genuinely wanting to help you, then you're actually doing them a favor because if someone's putting themselves out there to help you, they genuinely want to do that. They get joy out of that. And for you to tell them no, actually kind of makes that person not even feel good either. So you right, because then it's almost like they're not validated that you don't think that they're worthy enough of your support. You know, these people are offering you a gift. It's your choice if you're going to open it or not. Yeah. So um, I, my advice would be both ask for help. And then if someone offers, take it. I've been really working on that because I used to not be a good receiver. I felt like I, I wasn't, I, it made me feel like I'm not capable if I needed help. And now I'm like this, I'm actually gifting the person who wants to help me mm -hmm. because they want to do it. And, um, and, uh, and it's hard, but it's a great lesson to learn. Uh, now, so one caveat to that, though, is there are some people who don't have great intentions out there. Most people do. 
And there are some people out there that just are not qualified. And, you know, I see this on Clubhouse, for example, <laughs> that I'll be in rooms and somebody has opened up and shared and then this other person is just trying to sell them something or they're giving them advice that could actually be quite dangerous. And so just if you have that gut feeling that maybe that person, right. trust your instincts, trust that gut and ask for second opinions, right? There are people out there who, who are willing to help you that are actually qualified to help. And I know my, qual I am not a clinician. So if somebody comes and asks me things, I will refer them to somebody who I have a, a big network of people that I refer people to that are specialized in grief counseling or trauma and for, you know, there's, I consider myself an advocate and a connector of people to be able to put them in the hands with somebody who I think that they could work really well with. And so it's important to be able to identify who's there to actually help you or who is there just to help themselves. That's true. Well, that's a very great point. Well, tell me, what does it look like to work with you? So what, who, who is your ideal person that you like to help? I love to help everybody. Isn't that horrible? It's like, and I, we talked about this earlier. It's like, if you help everybody, then you're helping nobody. Um, but so I have a couple different ways to, to work with people. My business, Be Well with Dr. Haley. Um, I have really two avenues. I work with individuals, but then I also work with wellness professionals. So doctors, nurses, health coaches, life coaches, counselors, um, you know, clinicians of any sort. If you practice wellness and you just want to learn more about the brain so you can help your clients better, then I work with people like that. I, I try to make, and I do make neuroscience approachable and accessible to everybody so that they can in turn take that knowledge, feel empowered with it, and then be able to share that with other people. So that's one way that I work with people. And another way is, as I mentioned previously, on an individual basis as well, that I, you know, I always have consultations and like they're free of charge, <laughs> but, you know, to see if we would be a good fit and whether it would be through mindset work or through nutrition, through different, um, as I mentioned, I'm a connector to be able to help referral basis, things like that. Um, individual coaching and consulting, as well as group coaching, consulting webinars. I go and, and give a lot of talks to businesses and organizations as well, all centered around the brain, how it works, how people can maximize what they have between their ears, right? So either at a personal level or at an institutional level. Um, and as you know, coaches, I like to teach the teachers basically, That's because then I can impact more people that way. Well, then how do people find you? Somebody wants to contact you because they want you to come speak for them or they want to work with you or get connected. Um, how, how, what's the best way to contact you? So email is probably the best form of communication for me. Um, I do have a website um, and I know, Honor, you're going to be posting that in the notes. So people can contact me on my website. Um, you can book a consultation or just shoot me an email, whatever works best for you. And I am open to answering emails and questions and I love meeting new people. And honestly, I truly genuinely want to help people, but I do know my limitations. And if I can't help you, I will let you know and I will refer you to the best services that I personally think would help serve you the best. So um, don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, my email, you can find me on social media. I'm very active in Clubhouse. Um, I do have an Instagram and Facebook page, but I'm not, it's not my jam. <laughs> I, everyone keeps telling me I need to post more on it, but I am on there. So you can contact me so you can look for me and find me and reach out that way if that's what you do. Um, I need to, I need to be putting myself out there. I think a little bit more so people know my personality and know who I am more on those social media outlets. But um, well, Dr. if you're listening to this, hopefully you got a little snippet of who I am and know that I am approachable and feel free to reach out and contact me. Well, Dr. Haley is so great on Clubhouse. So if Thanks. you um, if you find her in a room, follow her if you're on Clubhouse and find her in every room because she always is dropping just golden nuggets. So <laughs> thank you. And I, and I love it. And all of her information I will post underneath each podcast or my YouTube channel. So you'll be able to contact her. But Dr. Haley, what's next on the horizon? I mean, you're always helping other people, but do you have a big dream yourself or, or, or something that you're working towards for your future? So, yeah, I, um, 
I mean, I have some gigantic goals, but I'm not ready to announce them to the world yet. <laughs> they're, they're for myself to journal about, <laughs> but on the horizon. So I recently founded Be Well with Dr. Haley. My website currently is under construction, but hopefully by the time this airs, it will be up and live. So that's really exciting for me. And I'm trying to figure it all out on my own. So um, really launching that and really taking Be Well with Dr. Haley to the next level so I can help the most amount of people. Um, but that being said, I am always going to be a college professor. That's something that I'm super passionate about. So I'm not leaving that. I love working with students and teaching in the classroom as well as online at the college level, but I also want to reach and, and impact other people's lives. So that's where the Be Well with Dr. Haley came about. So really that's the big thing on the horizon for me is seeing where that goes and where my big gigantic goals, which I will follow up with you when I, when I achieve them, um, you know, and just being more of a, um, a presence in, in people's lives and being able to help more people. And by doing that, I'm helping myself because I am passionate about it. I really, I am such a curious person as we talked about before constantly, I'm a lifelong learner. I want to learn more and I want to meet more people so that I can soak up more information and then I can go sit on my computer and figure it all out and then be able to share it um, with other people. So um, yeah, my, my business, my company, that's on the horizon. That's big for me. Um, and ideally, I'd like to be able to help retire my husband and you know have that life that I had as a child where we're all home together and vacationing together and being able to do those things as a family um, and to create that family unit that I was so fortunate to have growing up. So, um, you know, that that's big for me on the horizon. Well, that's exciting. And I, I can't wait. I'll have you back on the podcast when you reveal those new goals that <laughs> yes. reveal yet. But um, I'd love to end each podcast um, with the same question for each guest. So obviously this podcast is called the Honor at All podcast. So what are you choosing to honor today? Ooh, today I am honoring myself because my kids are being cared for right now. One of them is at a soccer camp and the other one is at a different camp. Um, and I got the dog and my husband home, but I can keep, <laughs> keep myself separate. But I'm going to honor myself by getting outside in the sun kid free, go for a walk, get some vitamin D on my skin, breathe the fresh air, listen to the birds. I'm going to put my phone away, be present with my breath and my heart pumping oxygen through my body. And that's how I'm going to honor myself. I woke up this morning saying, I need to move more. I always tell people to move more. I need to be practicing what I preach. And today is such a beautiful, I mean, you can see, well, you can't see outside my window, but it, you know, in Pennsylvania, it's gorgeous out today. And I need to get out there and yeah. honor myself and the peace and quiet that is in my life today. Well, I think that's good advice for everybody. <laughs> so, so enjoy. And that's it, folks. I mean, what a perfect way to complete this episode with the talented and inspiring Dr. Haley. Thank you. And until next time, remember, we're not promised tomorrow. So be present today, just like Dr. Haley said. It's a gift and take time to honor it all. Take Thank care. Thank you.